Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. The sheriff of Knaresborough places a skull on the table. Now a fibia. Now a tibia. These bones have recently been dug up from St. Robert's Cave, a favorite trysting place of the town. And now he puts a femur on the table, and the skeleton is almost completely reconstructed. A jawbone. Fingers and toes. And just let them lie there. The sheriff can see for himself who the skeleton is. Ah, Daniel Clark, all right. So that's what he's been doing these 15 years. Tonight, my report to you on Mr. Clark's skeleton in Mr. Aram's closet. The noise it made. Crime classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. <laughs> The Huxley Seminary for Genteel Females is extinct now, and a moral might be drawn from that. Last year on a stroll in London, its campus was defined for me. A triangle bounded now by a barber shop, a shear sharpener, and a free kitchen for a type of wanderer. Gone is the ivy, gone the girlish laughter, vanished the sound of silver bells that spilled the young ladies from classroom of Greek to classroom of how to conduct oneself at five o'clock tea. Silent now the small excitements of spelling bees. Only the imagined echo heard of Mr. Aram's Latin class. The problem, for example, of the Latin's preference for the use of the gerundive. Concilium urbium capiandarum. A plan of capturing the cities. Is that right, Mr. Aram? And it was so important that it be right... For Janice was 17, and it was necessary that Mr. Aram approve her Latin, for this was her plan of capturing Mr. Aram. Why, Stabida, Stabida, I do hope I'm right. Of course you are. And listen. Yes. Uh, when an adjective modifies two or more nouns of different gender, the agreement is as follows. The attributive adjective agrees with the nearest noun. As, for example, multi herbis, opida, vikikwe. Yes. You're a very good student, Janice. Thank you. I think now you've made up all the time you've missed so that I shall not have to tutor you in private anymore. Mr. Allen. Yes, Janice. I love you. Child. I love you truly. Homo laudandus as... Oh, please don't try to prove anything to me in Latin, Mr. Aram. I... Child, many girls fall in love with their teachers. And... Oh, every girl in school is in love with you, Mr. Aram. And I love you the most. That's very sweet of you. And I don't care that you're married. Oh, please, Janet. Look. Hmm? This poem I've written to you in the corner of my book. Oh, please read it. All right. Well, I know there's some mistakes in syntax, but... I think you've expressed yourself quite clearly. Sincerely, too. I think you'd better go now, Janet. Don't you think I'm beautiful? Lovely. Truly lovely. Oh, then you do love me. You're just afraid that no. you're... I'm an older man, Janet. Then my wife and I are blessed with happiness and love. And I cherish the life I have with her. But then what of me? Why, if you truly love me, you will suffer a broken heart. It will make you more beautiful still. Now go. This was no singular occurrence in the academic life of Mr. Eugene Aram. The young ladies, each genteel female of them, were caught in the web of his tender and warm charm, though never caught in his embrace. 
for Mr. Aram was a good man, an understanding man, a scholar of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, and a gentleman in any language. He was 38 years old, and for the last dozen years, his chief devotion was Ellen, his wife. For example, that very night. Close your eyes. Very well. Hold out your hands. All right. Now, open them. Well, well, Eugene. If you only knew how much I've wanted this for you. My dear. Yes, dear. To have bought this, how you must have scrimped. Oh, such a horrid word, scrimped. I call it saving for your joy. Oh, you're my beloved. Yes, yes, I know. How was school today? Well... You were smiling. What happened? Tell me. One of my Latin students. Oh, again? This one thought to woo me with an interesting Latin construction. Oh, poor child. Oh, well, it will pass with her if it passes with all the others. Only to fall prey to Mr. Black in manners and numbers section. Oh, come now, let us not judge. You're too kind. Well, there's not time in this life for malice. Too gentle. Too good. Truly? Do you believe that? No, of course not. You're my husband, and you're my love. Come, sit you down to your meal. And this was no singular homecoming in the domestic life of Eugene Aram. His wife... The whole being of her was caught in the web of his tenderness and his love. And she, unique among women, was caught in his embrace. Uh, Some other things to know about Mr. Aram. Uh, Though his salary was a small one, he gave a considerable portion of it to his church and to charities. Each holiday would see him bringing baskets to the poor. And his name was breathed in prayers all over the neighborhood. How, you might ask, did he get along at work uh, with his employers, for instance? Mr. Adam, of all the tutors here at Huxley, you are truly a prize. Well, thank you, Mr. Huxley. I have here a letter from the proctors at the university, Mr. Adam. Oh, yes? It caused a stir, it seems. Oh? Having propounded the proof that Latin and Greek are cousin languages and not mother and daughter languages. Yes, I wrote a paper to this effect and sent it to the... I have taught you. Thank you. You're a good man. Thank you, sir. A true scholar. Jane Huxley? Yes? Then this other gentleman must be Eugene Adam. Am I not right? And who are you, sir? Morban, Sheriff of Nailsborough. Yes? I've come for Mr. Adam. Come for him? To arrest him. Arrest him? For murder. Yes, sir, Mr. Adam. Will you loosen my shackle, please, for a moment so that I may dip a snuff? Of course. All right. Yes. Too tight? No. Hey, Sheriff. Yes, sir, Mr. Adam. You said... A murder. Which is the reason you are being taken to Nairsborough in chain? Murder of the Mr. Daniel Clark. That's right, sir. Who is Mr. Daniel Clark? He was the shoemaker. And why am I called to attest to his murder? You've been named. By who? Uh, Mr. Theodore Hausman. Hausman? Hausman. Who's he? You don't know him. No. He said he was a good friend of yours. Fifteen years ago, that is. I never heard of him. Well, sir, this is the way it was. Last month or so ago, a workman was digging in the limestone pits in Nairsborough. You remember where they are? You remember Nairs, but I don't, you sir. It's been so long since I lived there. Ah, I'll trace it, sir. Fifteen years. Well, to go on. Yes, please. Well, sir, this workman was digging and comes across a skeleton. Now, the townspeople there couldn't for their life figure out who the skeleton was, since pride is taken in resting people proper in the graveyard. Uh, yes, I can see what the problem was. And... Well, sir, someone remembered that fifteen years ago... Uh, a certain Daniel Clark, shoemaker, disappeared. And it was remembered, too, that uh, 
Mr. Daniel Clark had a close friend still about named Theodore Ausman. And you spoke with Mr. Hausman, I take it? Yes, I did, sir. And Mr. Hausman proved conclusively that the skeleton taken from the lion pits was not Mr. Daniel Clark at all. Then I don't understand. But he took us to St. Robert's Cave, showed us where to dig, and sure enough... Another skeleton. Right. Right you are. Which you identified as Mr. Clark's remains. All right. Right you are. With certainty. Of course, of course, sir. How do you know it was Mr. Clark? Why, who else would it be? Oh, I'm sure I don't know. Besides... Besides what? This skeleton had a skull bashed in. What does that prove? That it was Mr. Clark. But how do you know? Why, who else could it be? Come along now. his logic, the sheriff on the dusty ride from London to Knaresborough would repeat himself. Why, who else could it be? And smile smugly. When the carriage reached Knaresborough, the beloved schoolmaster was stripped of his clothes, given some rags to wear, and was thrown into the Knaresborough jail. Fifteen minutes after this happened, he had a visitor, the town stapler, a man chosen by the town folk to staple desperate criminals to the jail wall. Mr. Aram was secured in such a way as hardly to be able to move at all. Certainly he was immobile to such a degree that he could not dip a snuff he dearly loved. Fifteen minutes after he was stapled, Mr. Aram had another visitor. You remember me, Eugene? Vaguely, I think. Turn to the light. Well, remember me from when you used to live here? I think. I'm not sure. Teddy. Teddy. Teddy Houseman. Oh, you're the one... Who named you murderer. I see. First, I was named. Went to trial, too. But I was acquitted. You know why I was acquitted, Eugene? Why? Because I named you. I'm speaking against you at the trial, Eugene. I'm giving evidence against you. I'm the reason you're going to hang. Is there a light enough, Eugene? Can you see who I am? Can you remember me? listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland, and his report to you on Mr. Clark's skeleton in Mr. Aram's closet, the noise it made. about Yorkshire County, England. For in it, almost athwart the boundaries of East and West Riding, lies Knaresborough. Well, Yorkshire is a county rich in historical associations. The Romans were here, and the Danes, as well as the Celts, and the Normans, and the Northumbrians. So you see, it's really one of the most invaded places in the world. As a matter of fact, there was a time there among foreign armies when Yorkshire County was a standing joke. Roman roads can be seen, as well as ruins of all types. And caves are constantly found with artifacts and shards and bones. And in such a cave, the bones of Daniel Clark. I'm sure it's Daniel Clark. 
For I remember when Eugene Aram dug a hole and put him there 15 years ago. If it's not Daniel Clark, then who else is it? Hit him over the head with a shovel and buried him, Eugene Aram did. Of course, it's Daniel Clark. Who else could it be? But my husband is such a good man. Did you know him 15 years ago, Mrs. Aram? No. No, I didn't. When did you meet him? 12 years ago. In London. How? I was to market, and he followed me home. Did he? And he walked up the steps behind me. Did he? And I turned, and I was about to tell him to hide away. But he closed my mouth with a kiss. Did he? Yes. Then what kind of a man would do that now? Would a gentleman do it, I asked? My husband is a gentleman and romantic. And I wanted him to kiss me. Did he tell you where he was from? From Nesbro, he said. Come to London to study and to teach and to take wife. And he said he needed to take wife before he could study or teach. Did he say out about a man named Daniel Clark? He spoke of poets, not shoemakers. Did he say about a man named Theodore Hausman? He spoke of philosophers, not liars. Did he? Did he now? <laughs> Intimate a poet and philosopher. Is there? Is there now? Indeed, Mr. Arab is. A scholar himself, for listen what he has done. What? Self taught he is in Latin and Greek and Hebrew, as well as knowledgeable in other Sanskrit languages, as well as knowing history and doing sums without a back of sports. And he writes in a hand elegant and fine, as well as propounding theories as to the relation of one language to another. Cousins he called. Latin and Greek, not mother and daughter, as do Hessel and Roth. Do they now? Beloved by all. Do. Kindly and admired. Yet. Yet what? It looks as if he is a murderer. No. No, I'll never believe it. believe it. And why not, miss? Because I'm his Latin pupil. Yes, yes, I know. And I offered him my love. Did you? Did you now? Yes. And he did not accept it. Hmm. And why not? Because he's a good man. And he has a wife. And you say he could not kill. Oh, no. Not such a gentle man. You admire gentleness. No more. It's broken my heart. Sheriff Mobank went back to Nairsboro with definite impressions that Eugene Aram was loved by one and all, and that he was a mild man, and that no one would believe he could commit a crime so horrendous as murder. And nevertheless, Eugene Aram was brought to trial, and the greater part of the trial was devoted to Theodore Hausman's testimony, and this is the story he told. Fifteen years ago, he said, he and Eugene Aram had been friendly with Daniel Clark, the shoemaker. And one night, when they were all together, Daniel said... I have an idea, gentlemen. Concerning what, Danny? Concerning a way to make us rich. Do you now, Danny? How? Well, I'll tell you. You know of my wife, that she comes into fortune. You are a lucky one, Danny. Oh, but she's been coming into fortune now for over a year. And I'm still making shoes for the folks of Nairsboro. But this idea now... Tell us. Tell us, Danny. Now, all the shopsmiths of Nairsboro know that one day... I come into a sum of money. True, true. And all I've to do is to buy on credit. An advance, so to speak, until my wife inherits her fortune. Now, that's an idea if I ever heard one. And on credit, you could buy the finest clothes. For all of us. Jewels. For all of us. Silver things. For all of us. For me. For me. For me. For all of us. And then we could go to London. And live the fancy life. And beguile the London ladies. Where are you from, you handsome lads, they'll say. From Yorkshire, ma'am, we'll say, and give us a kiss. And they'll do it. They'll want to. Because we'll have money. And be dressed fine. Then do it, Danny. Do your idea. Do your plan. Danny. What? What of your wife? When we're in London, she'll be here to pay the bills. When she gets her inheritance. (laughs) When she gets it. (laughs) And Hausman went on with his story. He told how Daniel Clark went to the shopkeeper's. And from Mr. Chesney, he got several services of pure silver plate, and on credit, mind you. 
And for Mr. Malcolm, the jeweler, a fistful of diamonds and pearls. And for Mr. Fivek, the tailor, garments of leather and garments of brocade. And all this and more he brought to them, and ales and wines to have a party. And do you know where they had the party? Teddy said they had the party in St. Robert's Cave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it was oh, easy. Yes. Tell us, Danny, Danny. Oh, I told Mr. Chesney that I only wanted one silver service. He insisted I take three. <laughs> <laughs> I told Mr. Malcolm I was just uh, looking about. And he asked me, wasn't I the lad whose wife is coming into a fortune as soon as the court allowed? And I said, yes. He pressed a handful of diamonds and pearls on me. Oh. And Mr. Five, the greediest of them all, bolts of brocade and leathery piled me high with. What a fortune is here. Oh, let us drink and then we'll go to London. And then we'll... Danny. Oh, I like you, Eugene. Oh, warm friend. Oh, what a kind, gentle, warm friend you are. Danny, good friend. <laughs> Why? Why are you laughing? Uh, the trick the shadows make in this cave. Oh? As if you're holding high a shovel above my head. As if... I... Oh. Well, now, I believe you've killed Danny, Eugene. To have cheated his wife like that. He was a cheater, all right. You take half and I'll take half of what he cheated her of. And what will you do with him? Bury him. Bury him. And so Teddy Hausman finished his story. Then, you remember, the sheriff walked over to a table in the courtroom. My lord, this is the skull we found. The fibia, the tibia. The femur, the jawbone. And these are the fingers and toes. This is Daniel Clark, all right. Who else would it be? As sheriff of Nesborough, I've been asking that all about, and no one can give me answer. Oh, it's Daniel Clark, all right. Or my name isn't Teddy Houseman. And Eugene Aram put the side of the shovel to him as true as I stand. And what have you to say, Eugene Aram? My lord, I labor not with guilt, but with perplexity. For my whole conduct in life contradicts every particular of this indictment. I concerted no schemes of fraud, projected no violence, injured no man's person or property. My days were honestly laborious, my nights intensely studious. It is deserving of attention, my lord, that no person, after a temperate life, plunges into the very depths of evil. A man is never corrupted at once, Villainy is progressive, step by step. And therefore, you cannot believe that a man such as I committed this most hideous of all crimes. <laughs> Permit me, my lord, to observe a little upon the bones which have been discovered and lain upon this table by the sheriff. It is said that these are the skeleton of a man. But is there any certain known proof which distinguishes the sex of human bones? Perhaps at some future time, scientists will be able to tell the bones of a male from those of a female, but not so today. Now, here is a human skull produced, which is fractured. But was this the cause of death, or was it the effect of natural decay? If it was violence, was that violence before or after death? In May 1732, the remains of William, Lord Archbishop of the province, were taken up and the bones of the skull were found broken. Yet certainly he died by no violence offered to him, for we all know he died serenely in his sleep. More. Such a deed as I am accused of is wholly repugnant to every part of my life. I put myself upon the candor, the justice, and the humanity of your lordship, and upon yours, gentlemen of the jury. Eugene Autumn. 
Waring being found guilty by a jury of your peers, it is the sentence of this court that you be placed in Nairsborough prison alone so that you may commune with your soul and ask peace of your maker. And from this place be taken to the gallows and there hanged until you are dead. And your body shall then be delivered to the surgeons. May heaven rest your soul. How can they hang you, Eugene? The judge himself said that yours was one of the most clever speeches he'd ever heard. I know you didn't kill that man, and all of England knows it. They're forming committees. People are kind. Good news, Eugene. I've gotten up a petition. Scholars and teachers were banding together, and we'll save you. You have nothing to fear. That is wonderful of you people. Humanity. Another victory will be yours. Hello, Mr. Aram. You remember me, do you not? Janice, your Latin pupil. I'm so out of breath. I, I can hardly tell you. We, we've gotten up a paper. All kinds of signatures. Boys and girls. Students from all over England. Oh, certainly they, they won't hang you now. <laughs> As you no doubt have noticed, we are left now with an unexplained skeleton. The first one which sent the sheriff to Teddy Hausman. Well, we're left with it. It has never been identified. And nor exactly why Teddy Hausman was acquitted. Wherever true crime fanciers get together, in the case of Eugene Aram as mentioned, there is, without fail, a discussion as to whether or not he was truly guilty. And nevertheless, Eugene Aram mounted the scaffold June 12th 1758. Poised there, he was about to deliver another speech of eloquence when... And needless to say, everyone felt sorry for him. The people from all over wept. Oh, such a nice man. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about our next crime classic. Mr. Aram's Closet, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Van Wright was heard as Mr. Aram. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, Ellen Morgan, Herb Butterfield, Charles Davis, Richard Peel, and William Johnstone. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Paris, France, in the year 1673 will be our next concern. That was the year almost everyone had the virus, the deadly kind, or so they thought. It's listed in my files as the lethal habit of the Marquise de Brinvilliers. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>
through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.